All right. Welcome, everyone. I uh, hope you're all doing well. My name is John Phillips. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the graduate advisor for the Berkeley Math Department. Uh, basically, what that means is I handle all the administrative matters, uh, work on graduate admissions and recruitment, um, and uh, work with all of our PhD students. I'm really excited uh, today to be able to share with all of you uh, just a little bit about what our department's all about and uh, showcase some of the really awesome folks we have um, that make our math community really special. Um, so actually, I'll start off. Uh, joining me today, we have uh, David Nadler, math professor and uh, chair of our Equity and Inclusion Committee. Uh, Sugwu Shin, uh, also math professor, our head graduate advisor, uh, chair of the admissions committee, um, and vice chair for all graduate affairs. Uh, Vicki Lee, our director of student services. Uh, and we're also joined today by three PhD students. Uh, so we've got Audrey, Liza, and Roy. Um, all right, so a couple quick logistics. Uh, so if you don't mind just keeping your mic on mute while folks are presenting, uh, you're totally welcome to have your video on or off, uh, whatever works better for you. Uh, the presentation is being recorded, as I mentioned. Uh, we are going to post it to the Whova app. Uh, and if you have any questions during the presentation, you're welcome uh, to chat them uh, or uh, you can, if it's a quick question, we'll respond. Uh, we might table it to the end uh, if uh, it's maybe longer response. And we will have time at the end uh, if you all want to unmute, ask your questions or chat and other questions, uh, things we may have missed. Uh, so for our presentation today, uh, I'll start off just sharing some general program information, uh, then I'll hand it off to our other presenters, and we should have about 15 minutes for questions at the end. Okay, so uh, here we go. Uh, oh, actually, sorry. <laughs> I'm not sharing my screen yet, I realized. Let's see. All right, can I get a thumbs up if you all can see that? Awesome. Uh, okay. Uh, so let me go over a little bit about our uh, graduate programs. So the math department here, we offer two different PhDs, one in pure mathematics and one in applied math. Uh, the applications are actually the exact same for both. Uh, both go through the same review process. Um, and the actual requirements for both programs differ only in very minor respects. Uh, we don't really make distinctions between the two in day-to-day -day matters. Um, so this is to say, you know, it's possible to switch from one PhD to the other pretty early if you do that early in the program. Um, and I mentioned this in case uh, you are deciding between the two. Uh, you don't have to worry too much about which one to apply to. I'd recommend, uh, you know, checking out the faculty and seeing uh, which faculty maybe appeal more to your, your research interest if you're making that decision. Um, we also offer a simultaneous master's degree. This is only for current Berkeley PhD students and other programs. Um, so we don't actually offer a terminal master's degree. If you want to pursue graduate study in math at Berkeley, you're going to need to apply to our PhD program. Um, that said, occasionally we do have students who uh, do leave the program early and uh, get, get a master's degree as well. So that's also possible. Um, the department does support uh, another program, the Group in Logic and Methodology of Science. This is an interdisciplinary doctoral program, and it's shared between the departments of philosophy and math. Uh, today, though, we're just going to focus on the math and applied math PhD programs. Uh, so just some general information. Uh, in our program, we've got six pretty loosely defined research areas listed here uh, and about 50 faculty in the program. A lot of them are specializing actually in multiple areas here. Uh, so for any given area, you know, you're going to see a lot of faculty uh, who are experts in the field doing cutting edge research uh, in that area. And I do think the size of our program is one of our biggest strengths. Uh, you know, we don't expect students to come in with a defined research area necessarily. Um, and I think the size of our program really allows students to explore different areas and work with uh, different faculty before you end up settling um, on one research area. Um, that said, if you already have a defined area of interest, that's awesome. Uh, it might change, you know, through your course of graduate study, but I do recommend uh, reviewing our list of faculty. So, uh, on our website, just to make sure there are, you know, at least a couple faculty here who have interests that are matching to yours and that you could see yourself working with. Um, and our target cohort number each year is typically between 25 to 35 students. Uh, it just varies year to year. Um, and next up, funding. Okay, so we offer a 
uh, full financial support for five years. And this is going to cover our tuition, uh, health insurance, and provides a living stipend. Uh, so to receive the support, our students are funded really through one of three ways. Uh, most common is going to be teaching for the department. Uh, so there are also research opportunities too. Uh, those often become available after your second year. Um, often that'll be with uh, your faculty advisor and uh, fellowships as well. So there are a few campus fellowships that uh, students are eligible for and uh, different external fellowships too, like uh, NSF, for example. Uh, let's see. So our stipend. Um, so our uh, stipend typically increases from year to year. Uh, our stipend for incoming students this past year was uh, 32000 for the fall and spring semesters. Uh, the next co cohort can expect a similar level of funding um, or slightly higher even. Uh, and um, let's see. Uh, this is guaranteed for all five years as well, and it, this is for the fall and spring, so there is summer funding available as well. Uh, so students uh, might be funded through a research position or could be funded through uh, teaching again. Uh, that's an eight-week position over the summer. Uh, it provides around, uh, I think, nine to 11,000 is, is the range. Um, so the actual funding package could be higher, could be around 40,000 for those who do want to teach in the summer. Um, that said, teaching over summer is definitely a full-time job, so a lot of times our students end up wanting to take a little bit of a break um, during that period. Uh, okay, so a little bit of, whoops, on our program timeline. Okay, uh, so let me just give you a brief overview of the structure of the program. Uh, so in your first year, uh, actually before classes even start, we offer our preliminary exam. Uh, so this is mainly an exam that covers foundational topics in analysis and algebra, and we offer workshops each semester beforehand to help students studying for the prelim. Uh, if a student doesn't pass the first time, we allow uh, multiple retakes, and we really want all students to pass. Uh, the prelim is not meant to weed out students in any way. Uh, it's really just a way to help students identify uh, gaps in, you know, certain math knowledge in your first year so that uh, you can work on them. Uh, specifically, since your first year, you'll also be taking your coursework, too. Um, so that leads me to the next requirement um, for coursework. We actually offer a lot of flexibility for courses. Uh, in your first year, you have to take four courses, but none of them are specific. Um, they have to be two in the math department, and uh, most first years as well also take our pedagogy course. Um, so that's a course that uh, it's a great way, first of all, for uh, you all to get to know each other better for that cohort. Um, but it's primarily provided to give you support as uh, you're working as a graduate student instructor. Uh, you know, mo most first students, when they're coming in, they've never taught before, and uh, we know how intimidating that that can be. Uh, but by the end of the semester, you'll find that you're going to be a pro, and uh, that course really helps students um, get um, sort of hit the ground running, since a lot of students are teaching in their first semester. Um, and so that's mostly covering the first year requirements. That's everything there. Uh, the second year is all about finding a faculty advisor, uh, starting for your qualifying exam. Um, finding an advisor it can definitely be one of the more stressful aspects of any PhD program. Uh, we do support students throughout the process. Uh, we have a variety of events that are designed to help students connect to prospective advisors, especially since, as I mentioned, we have so many different faculty um, that you could be working with. Uh, we also have uh, older graduate students who are mentoring first and second years. Um, they get paired up uh, uh, in, in a volunteer mentorship program. Uh, and, you know, that's really an opportunity for our uh, younger students to learn from the more senior ones, uh, figure out who is going to be a good fit for them um, as a faculty advisor, um, things like that, uh, and just to help students really get acclimated to the program as well. Uh, so by the end of the second year, you'll decide on the faculty advisor, take your qualifying exam. Um, that's an oral exam that'll test you on three principal topics of your choice with a committee of four faculty uh, that you get to choose as well. And uh, lastly, once you advance to candidacy, your main goal is going to be to write the dissertation. And along the way, you're going to be publishing papers, giving seminar talks, presenting at conferences, um, things of that nature. And I know all of this might sound daunting. I mean, you know, PhD program is at least a five-year commitment in most cases. Uh, but if it's any reassurance, most of our students do finish uh, in five years. We're also flexible with students who need additional time. Um, but almost all, almost all of our students do end up graduating within five to six years. 
So that's everything for the program requirements. Uh, I did want to give a, a, a couple of fixtures here just to showcase our community a little bit. Uh, what you're seeing here is the courtyard in Evans Hall. Uh, so we're primarily on the ninth and, and tenth floor, uh, the top floors of Evans Hall in Berkeley. And uh, on the ninth floor, we have this really beautiful courtyard area. Um, students will often eat lunch here. Uh, our faculty are meeting with students here, and uh, you know we'll we'll use it for some events as well. Uh, I think here is actually our uh open house i'm pretty sure uh for this past year so that's our visit day for all admitted students uh and uh it's lunch with uh, faculty some some current students and uh the admitted students uh and so you know that brings me to the thing that i think uh really makes our community so so, so special this department um you know the grad students here are really the heart and soul of the department and they put a lot of effort into building and sustaining a really you know vibrant and thriving community here and i think that that's really if anything i think what i hear you know the most positive feedback from um with our current students uh and you know we we have a ton of different events going on in the department every week it's honestly a bit overwhelming i think um you know we have tea several times a week uh where faculty and students come together to uh, eat drink catch up and we have seminars colloquia um including we have a mini, mini cheerful facts seminar which is run and hosted by graduate students um and our students are you know taking initiative all the time to coordinate different kinds of activities picnics hikes and so on um so that leads me to the next topic on uh, student groups uh so we have a lot of different groups in in the department and a few on campus uh actually i think all of our students here today are in one of these groups or another of, of the department groups, so they might be able to share more. Uh, I'll just give a brief overview. MGSA, uh, it's a math grad student association uh, that represents our graduate students. They put on a lot of events. Um, they lead that peer mentor program that I mentioned earlier between older and younger graduate students. Uh, Unbounded Representation, a group for underrepresented students, and NRING for women and non-binary students and faculty. Uh, and yeah, the, those the list there uh, are some other campus groups. Um, and yeah, I won't I won't go into those too much. Um, but hopefully at the fair this week they'll they'll, they'll mention some of these groups. Uh, before I move on, I did want to mention a little bit about our student uh, demographics, in case you're wondering about those. So I think about 10%, about 10 of our students, uh, PhD students, identify as underrepresented. Uh, about 25% total identify as woman or non-binary. Uh, we're working hard in our department to make the department, faculty, graduate students, undergraduates more diverse at every level. Um, I do think it's showing in our recent PhD cohorts as well, uh, our newer cohorts. I think we have around more 35% are women or non-binary students. Uh, and we're working, you know, all the all the time to make sure that one, we have a community here that's more representative of California, um, of the United States. Uh, and also that when students get here, that they feel uh, accepted and welcomed and like this is an inclusive space for everyone. Um, so I would say that, you know, we still have work to do in the department. I think any STEM department, um, you know, I think anywhere you can really say that, that there's work to do. Uh, I also think that we're really committed to doing that work. I'll let Professor Nadler talk more about some of the efforts uh, that we're working on. Um, before that, I just have one more slide and then I'll hand it off to him. Uh, student outcomes. So if you're wondering uh, what are some of the things you might be able to go on to do with a math, math PhD, uh, these are just some examples of jobs that our alumni get right after graduating. So you'll see about three-fourths of our students, they end up going into academia. Uh, oftentimes they're starting off in a postdoc position. Uh, about a quarter uh, end up going into industry. So there's you know different sort of tech and finance uh, positions are the most common. Uh, these are all from recent graduates within the past uh, two years or so. Um, yeah, so hopefully that gives you a good sense of uh, our outcomes, what students go on to do afterwards. Uh, all right, and that's it for my part. I will hand it off uh, to David, uh, and I'll, I'll still control the slide deck if that's all right, David, so you can just let me know. Sure, please, yeah, thanks, yeah. that's helpful. Switch. Um, yeah, so if you don't mind take, taking it away. Of course, and you can hear me, right? That it's uh, I've unmuted. Okay, great, thanks. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, John. Um, I, I'll try to be brief. 
and uh, not be repetitive. I mean, much of what I want to say echoes things John's already said, which is that uh, you know the department is really committed, the university more broadly, to having uh, our community reflect the broader society. And we understand that that is uh, not a kind of goal, but an ongoing activity. We'll never kind of reach that goal, but rather always need to be working towards it. So I am currently um, the chair of the Equity and Inclusion Committee, which is a group of um, uh, community members, so includes faculty, staff, graduate students, undergraduate students, who get together every two weeks or so for a committee meeting to discuss any kind of ongoing issues in the department where it comes to equity and inclusion, and also to try to strategize and implement ideas about how to make our community a healthier, more inclusive place. So later you'll hear from Roy, Roy Zhao, who's, who's joined us, who's, who's our current graduate student equity and inclusion coordinator. So he's really the liaison between our committee and the department. Um, and he does a lot of the heavy lifting. But in any case, I play the role as chair of the committee of helping the committee guide uh, department, um, department efforts to, to, to help the math department become the kind of community we all can envision it being. So let me just briefly go through these slides and uh, I'll be around later and I'll be very, very happy just to chat and formally answer questions. So just to start, the math department has a stated mission to provide a healthy and inclusive environment for all. This is not like subtext, this is like one of our, our, our driving goals. We have goals when it comes to education, when it comes to research, but we certainly have goals as well when it comes to having an environment that is healthy and inclusive for all. Um, our current, maybe I already said this, our current committee includes people from across all uh, walks of the department life. And I just want to advertise for those incoming or potentially incoming students that um, we are very welcoming of students on the committee. I mean, that's, that's the lifeblood of the department, as John said, and also the lifeblood of our committee. So we really, really want student participation. So if this is something you're interested in, I'll just flag that independently of coming and doing your PhD, we also would be very grateful for any time you would help us um, you know, work on our community. Um, I also want to say that the the our committee is not just, um, I don't know what to say, it's not just that uh, someone thought it was a good idea to have a committee, the university has very generously funded our committee. And so we have the means to put into place all sorts of initiatives and have started to do so more and more in recent years. So I won't go into detail, but I just want to say that this is not just kind of some uh, window dressing or whatever you would call it that the department is putting up to, um, to, to try to make things look good. We actually are really invested in this and the broader university is really invested in this. So that's something important to say from the start. Okay, John, maybe you'll, yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, so just some guiding goals for us that, uh, you know, when I say that the, we're interested in the education of students and, and research outcomes, but we're also very much interested in the healthy community. So for us, communication, respect, mutual understanding are all important. So independently of us being an academic community, a research community, we also are just simply a community of humans working together and, and occupying the same space and trying to understand each other. And so from the very start, we really want to support any kind of communication that can help us get there. Um, one thing we've found that's very difficult, and so like this, this presentation is, is part of it, is it's very difficult to make sure that all students and new members of the community have all the information they need. So we really have the goal of having transparency and access uh, to all useful information for everyone in the community so that it's not just whether or not you're plugged into the grapevine. It's really that you feel like when you come and join our community that you have access to everything that anyone else does. That's, that's a very important guiding goal. Um, and then uh, responsiveness. We definitely want to hear from our constituents. We are not just trying to fulfill some kind of platonic ideal of what a community should be. We are a community of our members and we really want to hear from our members and really want to understand what's important to them. And um, so for example, we have recently instituted an anonymous feedback form, which um, allows community members to comment uh, without any concerns about any blowback about anything that's bothering them. And so we've gotten comments about issues that are deeply meaningful to people, issues about uh, what 
kinds of backgrounds do graduate student admittees have? And then we've also gotten uh, feedback along the lines of, is it possible to have a more diverse uh, food offering at tea? So we're very interested in all possible feedback and, uh, and being responsive to the feedback as well. Okay, so maybe I'll go to the next slide if John could. Um, yeah, so maybe now I'll just uh, kind of already, I guess, started to segue to some concrete steps towards these goals. Um, so one, and sorry, I don't know if you can hear it. Our neighbor's house has been under construction essentially for uh, uh, coincidental with the entire pandemic. <laughs> so I don't know. They, 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 have, they have exquisite timing of when they start to drill and things. Um, so one thing the university has funded is Roy is our current graduate student coordinator. He's served as this last year and serves this year. Um, but we will need uh, to sadly replace him after he graduates. And this is a position the university has funded that um, allows our committee to really get things done in a way that's difficult unless you have someone really devoted whose job description is to get things done. So Roy has really helped us implement things like we have moderated town halls, uh, some team activities that we have like starting this year with an ice cream social. Anyway, just things that bring people together in ways that are not just within the usual formal boundaries of uh, our program. Um, something that we haven't yet implemented, but is in the kind of arc of progress is having some kind of, we call them department families where smaller cohorts of students of different stages and faculty and staff are grouped together so that they can help each other navigate department life. So we find that it's both a great strength of our department and a challenge for many students that the department has the scale it has. So I know it, for myself, it's difficult to choose which seminars to go to on a daily basis. And that, um, yeah, that, that broader challenge exists for everyone. And so smaller, any, any way we can make smaller context, I think is helpful. Um, we have ongoing work. John mentioned that we're actively always trying to make our department more uh, in line with the broader society. And this includes in faculty hiring and bringing in visiting scholars and in grad admissions that we're always looking for um, diversity of viewpoints, diversity of backgrounds. And then finally, um, we've, thanks to hard work of Roy and Cecilia, who's a staff member who was on our committee last year, we have implemented a, an EIC committee uh, website where we're really trying to you know, realize our mission of having all information available to the community. So that there's no secrets about when you need to apply for X, Y, or Z, that really we're there supporting everyone, whether that person knows, uh, you know, which channels to pursue. I think maybe now we'll, this is, this is uh, Sugwoo maybe at this point. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Dave. Okay. So, so I I will mute myself and hang out, but I'll be very happy to catch up with anyone or you know just participate in the discussion at the end. So thanks for listening. Great. All right. So, Wu, if you want to, hey, yeah, uh, thank you, John and David. Uh, I guess it's my turn. So, uh, also try to keep it short, but we'll, we'll see. Um, yeah, the first page is pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, who are likely successful students in the math PhD program? Uh, well, you need to you need to be clear about why you're trying to do a PhD, and also uh, you need to be passionate about math. You're supposed to love math for sure, and then you're you should be ready to work hard because you know PhD is difficult. Uh, so, but it doesn't mean that you need to work like 100% of the time. It's also important that you need to have a good balance in your life, and well, self-discipline means that well. As a grad student, yeah, it's very different from a college life in that after your first year, typically you will have a lot of free time that is not operate structured. So what that means is that, well, apart from your maybe possible teaching assignment, you will have to be very good at time management. So, so you need to use time wisely uh, and yeah, and try not to procrastinate and all that. And for resilience, well, well, we definitely go through multiple setbacks uh, while in the PhD program. Everyone goes through difficulties, including myself and everyone that I know who has done math PhD. And probably it's not 
unique to a math PhD. Anyway, but well, the, what's important is you need to have ways to get back on track whenever things happen in life, right? So, so you, basically you want to, it, it could be your friends or it could be your hobby, sport, anything, but well, you, need, you want to have something outside of math so that, uh, well, which can basically cheer, cheer up yourself in some ways, right? When you're, you, do, you don't really feel that things are going in your way. Okay, so let me turn to the next page. So next I want to cover like what the admissions committee really wants to see in your application. Well, obviously there are academic aspects like your GPA or research teaching experiences, if any, uh, or research experience is not really required for teaching, but well, it can help with your application for sure. Um, and an important part of that is also your recommendation letters. So you want to make sure that you maintain a good relationship with the people who are going to write letters for you. Um, one easy way is to go to their office hour and, and also before your graduate application, you want to probably schedule a personal appointment with them and discuss um, your applications and also what you have been doing and basically update them with what you have been up to and you know, just make sure that they really know where you are. And another thing is that, <clears throat> well, you may easily think that, well, how well you're doing at the moment is very important. And that is to some extent, but also we try to look at your growth rate, not just how good you are right now. <clears throat> so <clears throat> your trajectory does matter. Um, and we understand that some people don't really have the same starting point depending on your various backgrounds. So um, we they do take that into account. And well, also we want to see that you're passionate about math and we want to see you know, all these personal qualities for uh, typically successful students like resilience and hard work, et cetera. Uh, oftentimes this is addressed in your letters or in your statement of purpose. Uh, and also, well, if you have any experience, like if you have been involved in promoting diversity, equity, inclusion, then Definitely, you want to say so in your somewhere in your application. It could be your statement of purpose or a personal statement, or it could be addressed in your letters. But um, that'll be a definite plus. Okay, maybe next. And here's um, yeah, some showcasing some faculty members. As John mentioned, we have about fifty full-time faculty members. Uh, there, are just a few of them. We have yeah. Virtues, Abel, Lynn, and it's, but well, for now, let me be quick about this because I mean, we have like 50 awesome people you will get to meet if you, uh, if you join us in the future. But let me uh, turn to the next page. Well, here's, uh, well, if you're, if you receive an offer from us, uh, Berkeley Math, then congratulations. But well, if, if not, I'm pretty sure that you'll likely get an offer from somewhere, some doctoral program. So we just uh, made a page addressing some important things you may want to consider before accepting an offer. So, well, obviously you, you want to do some research on who you might, you might want to work with. So uh, yeah, one, one thing that is important is that if you are interested in say uh, number theory, then are there like a few different options in number theory? Are there like a few faculty members in number theory, right? And it's a little bit risky to count on only one person as a prospective advisor, because first of all, I mean, that person may have a personal situation or if it, for various reasons may not be able to advise. Um, so yeah, you want to have uh, at least uh, make sure that a few different options, that would be nice. I mean, although it's not completely necessary. And then also um, your research interest also might change um, once you 
join the program. So you want to have some sort of, you know, breath uh, and, you know, like backup options, so to speak. And that's one thing. And another thing is, well, you want to, well, check your funding package carefully because, well, for instance, one important thing is like how much teaching you're required to do. And also you wanna kind of think about that relative to the time you wanna to devote to your research. Um, so that's also important. And well, location and cost of living also matter because, well, for obvious reasons. And it's not just about the math department, but also the place you want to live in. For instance, if you live in the city of Berkeley or in some neighborhoods, would you be happy about it? Uh, and I would say so is definitely yes for me, but that is probably not everyone has the same answer. And especially, well, if there's any downside for living in Berkeley, then yeah, the living cost is relatively high by the national standard. So it's something you want to think about uh, before accepting an offer. And, Another, another thing is, yeah, the department culture. And well, John and David uh, mentioned our effort to promote diversity. And there's certainly one thing I want to underline. But on the other hand, also, you don't want to just listen to us, but you want to actually talk to our grad students and find out that, well, how things are going. And I think, yeah, not just us, but a bit too, if you're talking to, students of any department, I think you'll have a better idea of like what is the department culture is like. And I think that's an important part to consider before taking an offer. And I'd like to wrap it up here and maybe I'll be around to answer any questions afterward. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Sagwo. Uh... All right, uh, that was actually a great segue too. We'll transition over to the uh, graduate student perspective. Uh, all right, so uh, before we get to the Q&A, uh, I'll introduce our three uh, current graduate students, or rather I'll have them introduce themselves, um, just to tell you more about the program from their perspective. Uh, and so maybe in terms of order, uh, we can just go alphabetical. So we can do Audrey uh, and then Liza and Roy. So if you wouldn't mind telling uh, folks just a bit about yourself, uh, you know, could be uh, pronouns, uh, year in the program, um, your area or areas of study and interest. Um, yeah, so Audrey, if you want to start us off. Hello, I'm Audrey. I go by she for pronouns. Uh, I'm a first year, as it says up there. I'm interested in geometry and topology and especially low dimensional and contact topology. Um, I'm Liza, she, her pronouns, um, also a first year, um, also Audrey's office mate, but she's in the office right now and I'm at home. Um, and I also like topology, um, also low dimensional, but I think that I don't know more specifically <laughs> yet. Um, yeah, all right, Roy, go ahead. Hi all, uh, so I'm Roy, use he, him, his set of pronouns. Uh, as sort of David alluded to, I'm also the GS, EIC, so I do a lot of um, DEI type work for the department to get paid for that uh, in lieu of teaching. I'm a, contrary to the uh, spread or the uh, slide deck, I'm a sixth year yeah. math student. I'm sorry, Roy, I didn't, uh, I didn't update it from last year because <laughs> you no worries. why I didn't do that, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I'm a sixth year PhD in uh, doing number theory with CINIUN and arithmetic geometry type things graduating this year. Uh, so I guess this will probably be my last time doing this. Um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so we can go in the same order. My first question for everyone is, if you could talk a little bit about maybe walk us through um, your experience from, you know, Considering applying to graduate school, how you ended up picking programs to apply to, why you ended up choosing Berkeley. Um, so just if you could walk us through your journey there. And uh, I, I'll actually stop sharing since we don't really have any more of the presentation. So you can see us a little bit better. Um, so yeah, Audrey, if you want to start us off. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, my main thing to start like 
narrowing down when I was looking at places I wanted to go to. Um, I was interested in going to a big pro program with a lot of people in places that were interesting to me. So this was one huge draw of Berkeley. It's this like behemoth program and people have already mentioned there's so much going on. There's so many people to talk to about so many different cool areas of math. Um, and I, uh, yeah, uh, and there were a few others that were kind of similarly large that I was considering and in similarly good areas. Um, I guess the reasons that I chose Berkeley as opposed to something that, that fit kind of similar criterion. Um, I had uh, some very good conversations with professors. I actually want to shout out David Nadler as the person who I was leaning towards going to another school. And then he and I had a uh, very good Zoom meeting last March uh, that kind of shifted the balance and eventually after I looked into it more I decided to come here but I, I do find that a lot of the professors here are um, very caring and and good people to talk to um, as well as being fabulous mathematicians and advisors. Um, yeah I mean so I think when I was applying I mean so I to make my like list, I sat down with like someone who like mentored me a lot in undergrad and he like kind of was like, here are all the schools with like a lot of topologists and I was like, okay, cool. And then like beyond that, I kind of like narrowed it down based on location and like making sure I had like an even spread of like a lot of target schools, like some reach schools and then like some safeties too. Um, just like, I also like, yeah, I guess when I was applying, it was like the aftermath of the year where like a lot of people just didn't get into grad school because like, um, I guess like the COVID year where we all like went back to school, but everything was like online, just like a lot of people didn't get into grad school that year. So I definitely like applied to way more schools than ended up being necessary. Um, and so I, I think that things are getting like a little more back to the way they were before in that regard. Um, but yeah, so I think it was just like, based off of location, like I really wanted to be back out West. Like I grew up in California. So, I mean, that was like, I did apply to a lot of schools in California. Um, and I guess like why Berkeley in particular? Um, well, I, okay. I guess like, because a lot of the programs I applied to were like pretty similar location ended up being a really big part of my decision. Um, just like of the schools that I liked the best, um I was kind of like okay like they are kind of all the same thing like really so I I kind of just I wanted to I went to like the the like open house visit day things um and just kind of was like trying to like assess how the like the vibes of the program felt um and like I think that the professors that I talked to uh and the students that I talked to at Berkeley were the most transparent about I I guess like no matter what I asked them, they gave me an honest answer, which I appreciated. I felt that at some other programs, it was like a little bit like more, I, I felt like I was, they were trying to give me more propaganda answers. And so I, I think what I liked about Berkeley was like the not as much propaganda. Um, and I think that that was like a huge appeal. Um, and yeah, so I, I think just like the size and the people I wanted to work with, those were like pretty similar at a lot of places. So yeah, location and vibes. Yeah, so I guess for me, I um, was actually in, didn't really have graduate school on my radar until my senior year of college. Um, so initially, I'd always thought that I would just do some sort of industry type job because that's what all my friends were doing back in college. And then um, as part of my undergrad, everyone was required to do an undergraduate thesis. And so I started doing that, I guess, the summer after my junior year and sort of had an enjoyable time doing math research. Um, and then I sort of had this crisis and dilemma of being like, oh gosh, what do I do? And I think the advice I got was just, you know, uh, industry will always be there waiting for you. Uh, even if you do a PhD, you can always go to industry after, but somehow with math, uh, it's 
a rare thing, I guess, to see people come back and do a math PhD um, from industry. And so I decided, okay, you know, I might as well, I have sort of nothing to lose in my youth. I uh, ended up applying to a lot of math PhD programs. And then I guess in terms of once I heard back from all these schools, trying to determine where I would go, again, had a lot of, <laughs> had a crisis about that. Talked to a lot of professors. Um, professor I did like my, and sort of, it was actually kind of funny because the uh, professor I did and un my undergraduate thesis with advised me to go to one school, whereas another professor advised me to go to here, Berkeley. Um, so I had sort of conflicting opinions, but I think what uh, made me end up decide to go to Berkeley was because uh, I guess one piece of advice I got from uh, one of my professors was your PhD is going to be where you, sort of what Sugu was saying, is where you live for the next five, six years of your life. And you don't want, and you want to make sure that you get sort of personal enjoyment outside of math. Um, I mean, math is great and all, but there's life outside of math and you want to make sure that that life is great as well. And so uh, I came to Berkeley. It was sunny when I visited. It was great, great weather. And that hasn't sort of uh, changed at all since I've been here. So yeah, weather and vibes sort of like what Lisa and Audrey were also both saying was eventually what made me come here. Can I add something, John, before you go to the next one? Yeah, I guess I just wanted to say also, even if you do end up doing a lot of applications, they do get faster as you go. Like, I remember the last one that I did, I timed myself and it was 29 minutes from the last one that I turned in. Like, they do get faster. Um, so I guess, yeah, um, just part of the process is like, not just like making a list, but also like you have to do them, but it like gets less scary as you go on. Like the first few are the hardest ones. And then like after that, it does get easier. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Uh, I'll, I have one more question and then we'll open it up to the Q&A. Um, so I'm wondering if you all have any advice for uh, students who are applying to PhD programs. Um, you talked a little bit about, you know, how you ended up choosing, um, but yeah, any other uh, tips for folks? Uh, and we can go in any order actually. Um, I mean, I would say like applying for fellowships like while you're doing your applications is a great idea because like if you apply for NSF, for example, um, it's due like this week, I think. So, I mean, maybe if you haven't started, don't stress yourself out, but <laughs> maybe if you're a junior or like if you have started, like make sure you like do that and like other fellowships too, because just having something like a document to start with when you're um, like applying to schools at least for me, that like was like a huge weight off my shoulders because I was like, okay, like I've already put this content into like a document. I just have to like tailor it a little bit um, and like put school specific stuff in here. But um, like, I, I think just like having one thing that's like done with is really helpful. Um, and even if you don't think you're going to get it, you might. I didn't think I was going to get it. I did got funding. So like it could end up being a really good thing. So yeah, just ap apply for fellowships, even if it's too late for NSF because it's too soon. Like there are other ones. Um, and yeah, I think just that is a really good thing. Um, and yeah, I guess also if you're, I was very scared about the prelim here. Don't be scared of it. It's like, fine. I mean, I didn't pass it because I didn't study for it, but like also the program wants you to pass. Like John's not lying about that. Like that's, that's not propaganda. Like, I think it's like, if that's like an apprehension you have about applying here, I guess don't let that stand in the way. Like there are faculty here who like do want to support you through that and like other students want to support you through that. Um, and like it really doesn't need to be like a whole like scary thing. Like I, I, I kind of was like worried about it. And then when I just like decided that it didn't need to be an issue, I was able to just like not let it be an issue. And I think that like a lot of people here will support you and like letting it not be a stressful like ordeal um so yeah th those were what i wanted to say um my like key piece of advice is talk to people talk to a lot of people um 
you are totally allowed to cold email people. Uh, professors are often busy, so they won't necessarily respond. Don't read too much into it. Um, but like email grad students, email, especially if you have um, identities that you're concerned about, as I do uh, with applying and you want to make sure that it's, in my case, like a, a good climate for queer people, um, you can find like lists of queer mathematicians online who will say like, hey, email me and you can email them and say like, tell me straight, like, is this school a good place to be? Um, I did this before I applied and ended up crossing some schools off my list that I was otherwise excited about, but heard some pretty horrible stories about. And then after I got in, it also was very good at helping narrow things down and also just like get your name out there. I mean, it. I guess some people think about this as a like, people might know who you are and it might help your application. It probably won't, but um, nonetheless, just like talking to people is very good. These are gonna be your future coworkers if you uh, stick in academia. And so, yeah, just, just chat with people. You'll learn a lot. Speaking of emails, I do wanna put uh, all of our emails uh, in the chat. Uh, so if any of you have any questions for any of us afterwards, um, feel free to shoot us an email. Um, all right, Roy. Yeah, I guess a uh, piece of advice I would say is definitely if you can um, try out research, do like, a, I mean, you don't have to necessarily do one of the fancy RU programs, um, but you know, talk with a professor at the university that you're at and um, see if they're willing to like spend some time in the summer working with you. Um, and I think this is important for just like, not only as Sabu was saying, it's like, will look good on your application in terms of having research experience and having someone who can uh, serve a letter writer attest to that as well. But also it's good to just know like, is this the right path for you? Do you enjoy doing math? Um, and I assume you guys probably all, all are if you're here, but yeah, it's good to have the experience and see what doing math research is like, because it's, I think, very different from, um, you know, taking like an undergraduate math class. Uh, and that's, yeah, so that's what I would say as a piece of advice. All right, great. Thanks, all. Uh, so let's move uh, on to the Q&A. I will stop the recording now.